Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hello. <laughs> What's up? Nada. How you doing? I'm doing great. I have no idea what we're going to talk about today. I did have <laughs> Neither a. Neither do I. I had an interesting phone call, <clears throat> which sort of brought up a question for me and reminded me of something you say a lot. I know that's a weird intro, but we'll get there. So. I was talking to somebody, I think it was on a Zoom call, I, for life, love me, can't remember who it was. And it, they said to me, they were in a situation at, I don't remember if it was at work or at home, where they had this moment where they thought to themselves, why is everyone else in this room wrong? Like, why don't they see that they're wrong? I'm obviously right. Hmm. And it reminded me of, one time you said to me, do you know what it feels like to be wrong? It feels exactly like being right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a very interesting way to think about it. And <clears throat> a, a, good, a good friend of ours uh, once, just the other day, said, um, how do you know that you know what you know and how do you know when you're right? And I think that's an interesting, I mean, how do you know when Evidence. You're... Okay. So say more about that. Well, I, I mean, we did a whole episode on, on science and, and how science can be applied to everyday life and indeed is really the only thing that, that we truly uh, apply to everyday life. I mean, people say all the time, like, oh, I'm not a scientist, but you are. We're all scientists. We all navigate the world in a way that, you know, we don't run into walls. We don't, if, if you don't, if you're not constantly running into walls, then you're a scientist, right? You're, you're using evidentiary perception and cognition to navigate the universe. If you, you know, can walk down a flight of stairs, you're a scientist. If you, you know, can you order mean- a sandwich and predict that you're going to get it. You're a scientist, right? I mean, that, like, those are all essentially predict. We're making predictions every single moment of every single day to do the most basic shit. Well, those predictions are based on evidence, based on cognition, based on you know observation. Observation, yeah. Um, and we're making those predictions, and then and then you know a good portion of the time we're right about those basic predictions. It's when things start to get more complex, like predicting what a market's going to do, or predicting, right? You know what your teenage teenagers are going to do, and you know yeah. th- as things get more complex, it's harder to make those predictions. But we're all scientists. Yeah, but I also think I think people can see can see that. In those examples, they can say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm observing things when I make a prediction about there's going to be a wall in front of me and I don't want to walk into it. I don't think people make that connection to how they're thinking about things. Right. Right. Like, uh, I think I'm right. You think you're right. Well, we're both we both feel like we've taken in evidence. Yes. We both feel like we know. Well, you don't feel well, that because we think, it's not a feeling. Sorry. We think we're taking in evidence. We think yeah. we have the evidence that we're right. Yes. At that moment. At that moment, yeah. So how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, how do you reconcile that? I mean, everybody walks around feeling. Well, the first thing I would say is you're definitely wrong all the time. No, you're definitely no, wrong. No, <laughs> I mean, we all are most certainly wrong all the time about everything. Hmm. And what I mean by that is our mental models are capturing a, a snippet of reality. If we think about that fraction of mental model over reality, M over R, you know, the, the, the numerator is much smaller than the denominator, like infinitesimally yes. smaller. Yes. So by definition, what that means is that you are definitely wrong. Even when your predictions turn out to be true, you're not seeing the whole thing. So it's, I think it's a safer bet to assume that there's a lot more that you don't know and aren't getting right than what you do know and are getting right. The, the DK, yeah. the don't know, is much larger than the no. 
Right, but how does that impact when you have to make decisions? Like being willing to make decisions based on knowing you only know a certain percentage of what could be known about a situation. You're basing a decision on the percent that you know. Yeah, I think you want to be really, really specific about what you know and what you know you know, mm-hmm. right? And and what versus what you, you know, think you know. Versus what you don't know, and but but you know you can make a decision if you if you are really sure of certain things because you have evidence or you have uh, you know observational f- some kind of fact yeah then you don't have to know everything to make a decision and have that probability of that decision working out well go in your favor you just have to know you know maybe one or two things. But you got to be clear about what you know and don't know. And so to that person that yeah. you were talking about, I would I would want them to sort of ask themselves the qu- a couple questions. One is, how do you know that you're right and they're all wrong? Right. What's the probability of you being right and they all being wrong? Mm-hmm. That has a lot to do with history, right? What's the, you know, to what extent are you often right? Mm-hmm verifiably right not just in your opinion right yeah verifiably right and everyone else is verifiably wrong like to what extent does that establish a pattern Mm -hmm. and i think the answer to most of those things is going to be yeah that doesn't happen often you're not verifiably right and everybody else is verifiably wrong yeah. You know, unless you really have a, a tremendous amount of confirmation bias. Yeah, I mean, there's a difference, though, between being verifiably right and being open to being wrong. Yeah. Right. So yeah. to me, the baby step is being open to the fact that I'm possibly don't have all of the information. I'm possibly wrong. Well, I think that's what I'm saying. It is like the the way to get from I'm right and they're all wrong yeah. to the possibility that I'm wrong is is there <laughs> is there anything behind this notion that I'm right and they're all wrong? I'm smart and they're all stupid. I'm you know yeah. I'm seeing it clearly and they're all seeing it uh, you know opaquely. Uh, is there anything to that? And if the answer is hmm, maybe not so much, then that opens you up. Mm-hmm. to the possibility of being wrong. Well, yes, and also, I mean, the biggest thing that's, that stands out as you're talking right now to me is, okay, but there's confirmation bias. Yes. And so what you're almost saying is the, the ana- antidote to yep. confirmation bias is being willing to understand that you're possibly wrong and seek out other forms of information Meaning you can you can you can confirm your way into verifying that you're right through bias by selecting what you take in. The antidote to confirmation bias is evidence, observational evidence from the outside world. Yes, that's how we get rid of our confirmation bias because confirmation bias is being in an echo chamber with our mental models, right, and projecting those mental models onto reality. Right. You know, we do that. A ton, an absolute ton. Well, the other thing is I was talking to a group of, actually, I was lucky enough to to do a keynote for 300 people, uh, 300 fantastic educators and administrators. And um, it always strikes me how transformative it is is for people to realize that they're seeing things through their mental models, that there's this, that you're not interacting directly with, with the world. reality. It's all yeah. mediated through the mental model you're building, which is based on the information that you're taking in. Yep. And so it seems to me when we talk about, I walk around thinking everyone in the room is wrong, you know, part of it is understanding, well, I'm building a mental model, but mm-hmm. they're all building a mental model. And mine doesn't have to be right, and theirs doesn't have to be wrong. They can all just be different. Yeah, I mean, and that turns out to be, I mean, this relates to so many of the 
previous podcasts. We did a podcast on bivalency, for example. I mean, th this notion that we can just label things right and wrong yeah. or black and white, you know, it's very bivalent or good or bad. Those are all really bivalent sort of frameworks that we put on things that almost always turn out to be wrong, ironically. <laughs> Inaccurate. Um, inaccurate. <laughs> and, and and so it's like, is it that you're right and they're all wrong? Or is it that like you have one perspective and they have different perspectives? And if we looked at the thing from multiple perspectives, we would kind of get a fuller, more dimensional picture of, of the situation or the, the conflict or whatever it was that we were looking at. Right. And so I, it's just hard to imagine that all these other people in the room don't have there that there's zero value in their perspective it's hard i mean it's possible that you could just be a, a bun, an eagle among turkeys um <laughs> not that turkeys are turkeys as animals are bad wonderful. no like uh, benjamin franklin wanted that to be the national bird it, you know you know it yeah. could have been yeah anyway uh <laughs> they they you know, it could be that that's the case, but it's highly improbable that none of the other people at the table have any value in their unique perspective on the issue. Right. That's just improbable. Yes. Okay. So, so let's say let's let's make it a personal example. Let's say I'm a per. I mean, I'm not, but let's say I'm a person that walks through the world. I've just you know for whatever reason I've had experiences and I've been raised in a way that I walk through the world believing that I'm mostly right. You know that yeah. I'm right most yeah. of the time, and I don't realize that it's a problem until my inner my relationships are failing. I'm not thriving at work. You know I'm not getting along with my coworkers. There's conflict, you right. know, around me. So what what do I do about that? Where do I start if I want to um, disabuse myself of that idea? Well, if you even had the awareness in the first place that that was the case, yeah, then that would be an easy problem to fix. Because once right. you have that awareness, then you know it's like That's once you that. see the problem, you can solve the problem. The problem with folks that that tend to be like that is. A lot of that's coming from an emotional drive of ego or something yes. like that, where um, they're putting up all these barriers to feel, to kind of feel good about themselves. And as a result, they never get to the point where they get to that questioning state that's or true. that curious state or that love reality state where they say, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. No, because, because to be wrong would be to challenge their their very identity. And so the first thing that you have to do with folks like this is separate their identity from their mental model, right? You have to separate their identity from their mental model. Because a lot of people think that what I think and what I know and what I'm right about is who I am, and it's not. You, I mean, we, we have thoughts all the time that are completely erroneous and bogus. Okay, well, let's slow down a minute because I think that could be confusing. Yeah. Separate our identity from our mental models. You're saying who we are is not dictated only by what we think. Right? Yeah, I mean, if you're at a meeting at work and you think, hey, we should go towards market A, not market B, you know, and that's my opinion. If, if you're so sold on that opinion... Oh. That it that for someone to disagree with it... Feels ...is to challenge your identity... Mm -hmm. Right. Then you're not you're not going to explore the possibility that you're wrong because your identity is on the line. You have to protect your identity. So if we can separate your identity from your mental models, from what you think, mm -hmm. then then if somebody challenges this mental model and, and, you know, even worse, if it turns out that this mental model is wrong. Right. Or even stupid, you know, <laughs> God, God forbid. forbid. <laughs> then nothing happens to your identity because your identity is not the same as your mental model, right? And I think, ironically, this kind of happened to me in the reverse as a young kid because I, uh, because I didn't know that I was neurodiverse, because I didn't know why I was failing in high school as a kid. They didn't have all these labels and things like that. I just believed and still kind of roughly believe to this day that I'm wrong about everything. It's true. That I'm just kind of mostly dumb and mostly lazy. Like, that's what I learned in school. 
That's what I learned in 12 years of schooling was you're dumb and lazy. Because you were different. Because I was different. Because I was a fish trying to climb a tree. Right. And, you know, and Not because they, you were actually dumb. No, I don't think I am dumb and lazy. Like, I, I know I don't think I am anymore. But I think, like, you're when you're taught these things, mm -hmm. you get in the habit of, oh, I'm, I'm dumb and lazy. I probably am not right on this. Mm -hmm. And I actually kind of have the reverse issue, which is most of the time I think I'm wrong. And a lot of the times it turns out I was, I was kind of, like, pretty close to accurate. Um, but my my bias is towards that I'm probably going to be wrong about stuff, which ironically kind of makes me a good scientist and like, but yeah. it, but it, when you yeah. learn early on, if in order to survive that, this might not make sense, but in order to survive that onslaught of social, in a sense, feedback or criticism, you have to separate your identity. Why? You have to sort of go, oh, like I'm maybe I'm stupid, right? But I'm still me. I Meaning you have to sort of train yourself. Uh, I'm I'm struggling with it a little bit. What you're saying, yeah. which means other people might probably with it too. <laughs> so I think what you're saying is is you have to you have to be able to understand that your mental models are temporary, they're fast, they're things you're building all yes. the time. They're not who you are. They're not who I am. They're just things that you're thinking as you interact with the world. Bingo. And therefore if somebody insults them, insults them, they're not insulting you. They're talking about your thinking about something or your idea. Yes. Not you as a person. Yes. And that's because the identity has to survive the onslaught of that. Because you're going to be challenged a lot in your life. Yeah. And your thinking is going to yes, be challenged a lot. Exactly. Which doesn't have to mean you're being But imagine the opposite happens. Imagine that, imagine that you're going through life and everything you do just works out perfectly. And everybody thinks you're a superstar. Yeah. Well, when something happens later in life, because life's eventually, yeah. gonna, you're going to eventually stop being a superstar at some point in life, right? Yeah. Like life is going to become challenging enough that not everything goes perfectly. Right. And when that happens, you've gotten all this, like all these yummies for being a superstar. Yeah. And so your identity is wrapped up in that. And when all of a sudden that is removed your identity is challenged. And that's where you have a, a life crisis where yeah. you have to figure it out, like right? Who am I? Who am What's I? What's my value? If, yeah. if you remove my superstardom, who am I? And if you remove that I'm a great student, if you remove that I'm yeah. you know, a great athlete, if when, when we remove that, mm -hmm. what's left? Right. It, for my identity to occupy. Which is why people who are suddenly fired or have to change careers or athletes who have an injury that ends their... That ends their career, They yeah. have this massive moment of, what what now? Yeah, like, that, who am I? That is I was I swimming. Yeah. I was, well, you know, football or whatever. And now all of a sudden, who am I? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about, about the identity getting conflated yeah. with the activity or the mental models or whatever. Right, but the, the the other part of that then is you have to, if you think that for yourself, if you can separate your identity from your mental, then you have to also separate other people's identity yeah. from their mental model. So yeah. you can't label people. Wouldn't it be a wonderful world? Well, it would be a wonderful <laughs> world. Right. Wouldn't that be a wonderful world if people could just yeah. say stupid shit yeah. and not be afraid to make mistakes and not be afraid to and not feel not get it perfectly right. Not feel anxious. And not feel challenge. anxious if they don't get it perfectly right or say it perfectly right or you know, and, and that we give them the same empathy that we would like to For be ourselves. given to ourselves, which is to be like, hey, what I'm saying is not who I am. What I'm what I'm thinking is not who I am. It's just I'm just exploring mm -hmm. and whether or not market A or market B is the market, we'll find out. Right now, I'm sort of leaning towards A, but I could totally be wrong. And what's the harm in that? Yeah, there's a lot of parts to what you just said. So the first thing is, A, testing your mental models. Being willing to test your own mental models against yeah. looking for evidence, looking for, uh, totally. you know, more That's what we mean that. when we say love reality. Yeah. And love reality kind of has two parts. For me, love reality has two parts. That's why I love it. No pun intended. 
Um, love of reality is the that we genuinely want to. We're genuinely curious about what the reality is. Is it market A or is it market B? Is this kid, mm-hmm. you know, having difficulty or are they just thinking differently? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, whatever whatever the situation is that you're deeply curious about what's actually going on. Much more curious about what's actually going on than what you think. Meaning, yeah. under, being curious about reality is loving reality much more than loving your own thoughts. Because thoughts are cheap. Like, we've got 90 billion neurons. We yeah. can make innumerable thoughts. They're, they're quite inexpensive. Yeah, and I think you could extend, I agree, you could, you'd extend, you could extend loving reality to even a step further, which is loving being in sync with reality, loving being in alignment yes. with reality, yes. being in a place where your behaviors, which are shaped by your mental models, are, are the result of taking the time to think about, you know, how you're thinking about something, how it's actually happening, and then using that to inform your choices, using right. it to inform you, then you would have greater success, I would imagine. Sure. And the more aligned you are with reality, the more success yeah. you're going to have in all domains. The other piece is not just the curiosity and the alignment, but really appreciating that reality is giving you feedback. Yeah. And like, what can I learn from the feedback that reality is giving me? And a lot of times those are the hard lessons, but they're only hard because if you don't learn them, reality will teach them again. Reality, reality has like an infinite lineup of remedial courses, yeah. right? Yeah. An infinite lineup of remedial courses. Yeah. And it will keep teaching you the same life lesson yeah. until you learn it. And it does. it's very patient. Like it doesn't care if you don't learn it the seventh time. Yeah. Now it's gonna cost you to not learn it the seventh time and the eighth and the ninth and the yep. tenth. It's going to cost you in pain and suffering. But reality is like the most patient. Yes. And it's going to keep teaching you that life lesson over and over again mm-hmm. with the same dysfunctional jobs or the same dysfunctional relationships. Like really costly things, right? Yeah. Dys- a dysfunctional relationship is a pretty cost costly thing in life. Yes. If you go through one of them, you can definitely recover from that if you learn. Yeah. But if you go through five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten yeah. dysfunctional relationships and reality keeps sending you the same yeah. archetype so that you mm-hmm. can practice again. Well, I mean, and it, that's re- rough. it reminds me of probably. That is rough. Yeah, no, I mean, it reminds me of so many conversations that start with, I just don't know why this is happening. <laughs> You know, like I can imagine, I remember me in my teenage years, my 20s, my 30s, talking to my friends, why am I here again? (laughs) How is it possible that this is the same as that? Yeah, because reality is trying to teach you something and you're ignoring it. You're not. That's why you're here again. That's the answer. Yeah. Reality has been patiently trying to teach you something and your hubris and your stubbornness and your echo chamber of self-loving of your mental models yeah uh rather than reality is uh getting in the way of you learning the lesson there's a there's a thing i I don't know if we've talked about suddenly syndrome but there's a thing called suddenly syndrome we have not that i remember suddenly syndrome is the idea that you know how, how did this suddenly happen to me you know how did i suddenly end up being 400 pounds or how did I suddenly end up getting a divorce or how did I suddenly lose my job there's nothing sudden you in order for anything really tremendously sudden to happen it's usually the buildup of many micro choices Mm -hmm. right the micro makes the macro and you have to ignore all those micro choices for it to, to feel like it's suddenly. 
Yeah. So they call that suddenly syndrome, and, and yeah. uh, it's it's kind of an important and that's idea. You haven't paid attention along the way yeah. Yeah. to the feedback that you were given that you were heading towards those things. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you've gained five pounds. Hey, mm-hmm. you've gained twenty pounds. Yeah, hey, you gained those hundred pounds. You gained a hundred pounds. Yeah. yeah, it's like if you had if you had been <clears throat> thinking about and and purposely paying attention to the feedback, the evidence along the way, right. then you could have avoided that pain point. Yeah, another way of saying that that I love, and you can use this in lots of scenarios, it's like you didn't gain 100 pounds. You you gained one pound 100 times, (laughs) right? You didn't gain, you you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. you, you, you didn't get a divorce. You, you know, snipped and chipped away at the relationship a thousand times. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like death by a thousand paper cuts, you know. Yeah, it's brutal. No, suddenly. Yeah, so it's, it seems like if you think about, I mean, one thing is it should be a red flag when you walk into a room and think everybody else is wrong. It's kind of a red you flag. You should probably say to yourself, hmm, maybe I should pause a moment and consider the possibility that I am in this place where I just think I'm right. I haven't checked my own mental model. I'm not valuing that everybody else is building a different mental model that could be valuable. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I would say is, and if you're, if the person, the people that are having this problem are ready for this level of honesty, <laughs> is what are you getting by believing that you're right and everybody else is wrong when that most certainly is not the case. What are you getting? Yeah. Right? What little Scooby snack are you getting? Yeah. You know? What do you, what Scooby snack, like the seals at the, you know, they're like, oh, you know, the little, the little fish snacks. Uh, Like, what are you lining up for to get that snack? Yeah. And and why do you keep doing it? Because you're getting something out of it. Like the human mind is very logical, believe yes. it or not. And like you're never you're never doing something for no logical reason. There's always a logic behind it. It doesn't mean that it's like logical from the outside. You go, "Oh, that person's kind of really hurting themselves or harming themselves." But right. from the inside there's a logic. And the logic is I get to feel right, even if I'm not right. And that little Scooby stack is what I'm after, the yeah. feeling of being right. Right. So I get to feel right. Yeah, so then if... But at what cost? Well, yeah, yeah. so I think you have to ask yourself at what cost. At what cost? I think you also have to... This is This might be a little more difficult, but you also have to figure out What's a healthy substitution for that totally. little 100%. Scooby snack yeah. that you're getting? So is there another mm-hmm. way in your life that you can get that feeling, whatever that sort of, I don't know, dopamine or whatever yeah. it is you're getting yeah. from that moment? That little kick. You know, that's little something that's... <laughs> you get a little... No. No. It is. No. I'm not saying to do that. I'm saying like that it's, it's like a little bump. Yeah. Terrible. We're definitely editing that out. <laughs> no, I'm not advocating. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Coke use. I'm just saying, like, you're getting a little, a little bump. You're it's getting ahead of something. Right. But then, so the question, so then to me, people need that. People need those Scooby snacks, right? Yeah. At some level. And so. Well, they, they've accustomed themselves to needing that from, from that source. Right, so but there are Scooby snacks everywhere. Yes. The world is full of Scooby snacks. You just got to decide which Scooby snacks are most functional for you. And healthy. And healthy for you. Right. And is it is it healthy for you to get a Scooby snack based on being right when you're not and everybody else being wrong when they're not? Well, yes, or even that. That it's a primary that that the primary means by which you validate yourself comes from others, rather than from within, right? Because that's what it is, if you think about it. What's the what's the eyebrows for? If you get a Scooby snack, hear me out. Then okay. you do what you want. If you get a Scooby snack from feeling right, yeah. In you know, 
in relation to others, yeah. then you're actually getting that, you, it's almost like you're validating what you think is your identity based on how others are reacting to you rather than how you, how you are it yourself. No, I think it's quite the opposite. Say more. In this particular case, there are people who get va external validation, and that becomes a problem, too, where yeah. they're constantly seeking external validation rather than internal validation. Mm -hmm. um, but in this particular case, you're creating an echo chamber of your own making. Not everybody at the table thinks you're right. True. You have decided that you're right and they're wrong, and you are handing out the Scooby snack that says, aren't you amazing, you know, to be so right when everybody else is so wrong. So you're that's yeah, all happening that's internally. Like internally. They could all think you're a complete fucking moron. But to in your little internal in your world, mind, yeah. you're creating a world where you are the the dolphin and the trainer and the Scooby snack. And you're in control of all of it. Right? And you get to hand out as many Scooby snacks as you want because you're living in a facade. You're living in a fake world right. of right. your own making. Right. That's very different than I'm going to go around and constantly people please so that I get external validation for people pleasing or something like that. Yes. And what, what would... Neither. I mean, both of those are dysfunctional, but they're dysfunctional in different ways. Yes. And without knowing it, I just perfectly demonstrated how you can be open to being wrong. Yes. In a moment. I listened to you and I considered what you were saying. I was like, oh, maybe I'm not quite thinking about it the right way. Yeah. So see how easy that was? Yeah, maybe. You could be right. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just kidding. Or what's interesting is... It might not be right and wrong. Right. There, We could be on a continuum. Yeah. You could be sort of on um, one place. And I mean, the question is, do does everybody at the table agree with you, right? If yeah. everybody at the table is like, oh, you're always right, and, you know, that's, that's a different situation. I think you would need a new team if everybody... You, you might want to get rid of that team. <laughs> you, might wanna get, you might want to get rid of that team. Then you definitely probably stack... Or change your leadership style yeah, or something. Yeah, definitely stack like the team your, in your favor. Your David Koreshing. <laughs> yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Okay, so guess what time it is. What time is it? It's time to summarize and wrap it up. Oh, really? Was yeah. that the podcast? Well, yeah. Wow. It flies when you're was... having fun. Yeah. Didn't Kermit say? <laughs> Every time. What is it? <laughs> time fly. Life's fun when you're having flies. No. Kermit the Frog said that. I thought Kermit, Kermit the Frog, the frog said, here. time flies when you're time. having flies or when you're eating flies. No, life's fun <laughs> when you're eating flies. Time's fun when you're having flies. Time's fun, fun. when you're See, having flies. See, we were both flies. right to degrees. Kermit the Frog here. You were a little wrong and I was a little wrong. Time's fun. Time flies. What? Time's, time's fun, fun when you're having flies. Time's, Time's fun, fun when you're when having you're... flies. Wow. All right. So now it's actually a wrap. That's a wrap. I don't know. That one went fast. Time flies. No, time's Time is fun, fun when, when you're, you're having, having flies. flies. We need some flies on the table. We need Kermit. <laughs> a little like. <laughs> <laughs> Kermit was stud. pretty baller. Kermit was a stud. He was a stud. Yes. Although he didn't have much luck with Miss Piggy. I think she secretly liked him. Oh, I think she loved him. She loved him. So I'm pretty he sure had a they had a, with, a relationship. He had no, Riz, no. as the as the young set say. <laughs> Kermie has Riz. <laughs> she was just playing hard to get. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what was happening there. I think there. that's right. I think that's right. All right. That's it. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs>